Hi. <laughs> Um, well, good evening, afternoon, morning, whatever time it might be when you are watching this. Uh, and hello to the single person watching it right now live. <laughs> um, uh, and welcome to our, I think it's the number 17, uh, to our 17th Octoprint on Air uh, broadcast episode thingy. Um, first of all, the usual stuff, uh, the short, a short, quick outline of the uh, what we're talking about here today. So first of all, I will telling you as usual what I've been up to, then what will be the next steps. And also we'll have a, yeah, not, not even that small Q and A segment this time. Um, as usual, uh, for those of you watching this live, there is a live chat on this side, uh, if you're on desktop and down there, if you're on mobile, and I'll keep an eye on that in case you have any, um, any questions that you want to get answered right now, like like very pressing ones. Um, and other than that, yeah, don't get distracted. Very funny, Brian. <laughs> I just got distracted. Um, and other than that, uh, I'll just uh, yeah basically run through the stuff that I've uh, I've prepared. So let's get started with this, I guess. Um, first of all, what I've what what I have been up to. Um, yeah, I don't know how many of you actually monitor the GitHub repository or rather the commits in there, but uh, I've been working and working towards 1.3.9. Uh, fixed a couple more bugs uh, that were reported since 1.3.8 and uh, also added some improvements and small new features. For example, um, uh, after um, I, I asked for some input from the community, uh, on, on various channels, I now uh, found some more identifying information regarding printers that do not support thermal um, thermal protection and those uh, that could be identified easily are now, uh, yeah, will now also be identified and reported in, in Oct by Octoprint when connecting to them. So just like with the ANET A8 that was uh, added as the first printer of this kind, in 137 or 138, uh, basically the same release with just a minor uh, fix. Um, they will now tell you, oh, by the way, the firmware you are running on there does not have um, thermal protect, th thermal runaway uh, detection enabled. And uh, this is, yeah, this can be scary and uh, maybe you should look into fixing this. Um, also uh, something I added uh, something that I added is um, there is now a way for firmware to tell uh, Octoprint, hello, I have some information that I need from the user. Please show them a dialogue that looks like this and show him, uh, show them uh, three or two, or one, how many ever buttons uh, so that they can select what their choice is. Um, that was something that I talked to about with the guys from Prusa a while back because it was interesting to them for some stuff like the filament run out detection and all that. And so now this will be built into core Octoprint 139. And I uh, thought it would be maybe nice to show you how that will look. I just now have to figure out how to switch over. Huh. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is how this stuff is documented. Um, basically, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bundled plugin. Um, it defines a couple new action commands. And I don't know if you have ever seen action commands. It's basically commands that look like this. So slash slash action uh, colon, and then a keyword and a number of um, optional parameters that the firmware can send back to the printer host that's connected to it. So in this case, Octoprint or any other uh, host software. And if the host software supports them, then they can trigger actions uh, based on those. And there were already a couple of action commands implemented in Octoprint, like uh, you could have your printer tell Octoprint to cancel, pause, resume the print, disconnect from the printer and all that. And with 1.3.9, we now also have this action command prompt support plugin uh, that allows you to, uh, as, as the firmware, to trigger stuff like this in Octoprint. Um, or stuff like this. Um, so basically, to quickly demonstrate this with uh, the virtual printer that is inside of Octoprint, I'll now tell that to trigger uh, such a t such a prompt, and it will immediately show up 
here and then when you click one of these buttons, Octoprint will send back a configurable command with the index of the button that you selected. So in this case, it would send whatever you configured uh, with the index 0, 1, 2. And uh, you see here that currently M876 is configured as the command. So this um, is a feature. Uh, let me quickly swap back to myself. I hope that worked because right now I'm not seeing anything. Okay, right. <laughs> um, this is a feature that uh, currently isn't supported by any firmware that I'm aware of, apart from maybe my virtual printer. Um, and um, so right now, this is not something where you will be able to immediately uh, utilize it once 139 gets released. However, I really, really hope that this will change soon and that some uh, vendors or maybe even mainstream uh, mainline firmware uh, developers will look into utilizing this uh, just like the original action commands that are now actually I think supported at least in mainline Martin uh, in case of specific things that require Octoprint to pause for example. Yeah. Um, so that would be that. Um, I hope that I'll be able to push out the first release candidate of 139 um, very soon, hopefully maybe next week, but I am not completely sure if I can manage to, to make that. Um, maintenance work in general has been a bit slower than usual for me because, and this is the next thing that I uh, um, want to talk about, I finally got back to working on the new com layer that is supposed to go into one for all. Um, I am now sticking to my time boxes again that I briefly mentioned in Octoprint on air number 13. And um, that basically means that three days per week are now more or less fully dedicated to development work again, instead of maintenance, 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 maintenance. The problem with maintenance is that no matter how much time I dedicate to it, it will always eat up that much time and more. So I really have to um, time box this a bit. And um, this allows me to now finally being able to concentrate again on something as complex as this uh, com. Uh, layer rewrite uh, for more than just a couple of hours per per, uh, per setting, so to speak. So it's it's really really great being able to uh, to do this multiple days um, in uh, after another instead of having to uh, switch back uh, switch switch context uh, every every single day or even even multiple times per day. Yeah, so the current state of this new com layer is actually surprisingly. Uh, yeah, far. Uh, it's um, yeah, basic printing should already work again. Um, I uh, also debugged the recent handling last week, which still had a lot of issues, but now they should hopefully be all uh, tackled. And also the stuff that we are used to from Octoprint by now over the past years, stuff, stuff like dynamic firmware detection, um, from the feature detection, uh, capability report evaluation, auto automatic temperature reports, stuff like this. So this is all already in there. Um, what is still missing is uh, things like streaming to SD and printing from SD, because uh, I also changed a lot of stuff in the underlying um, in the underlying print job concept. So basically we now have a print job concept, which in the long run will hopefully also allow something like queuing functionality and all that. Um, and yeah, there are still a lot of things that I have to add that I added to the current Octoprint stable versions over the past year or so that did not yet, uh, uh, yeah, that are not yet available in the com layer in the new one, but um, it's I'm making good progress on that thanks to being able to concentrate on it for more than a couple of hours at a time. And I'm very positive that this will now go forward in big strides. Um, but before you ask, no, I'm not able to tell you yet when all this will be ready to be merged into 140 and when 140 will be released. Um, it's way too early for that, but I'm, I'm really happy to finally be back on actually working on it by, yeah, as said as, as that actually makes me by just taking the time because waiting for it to uh, just show up on its own is, is not happening with a project that size, I guess. Um, yeah. And uh, what I also did over the past couple of weeks, as promised, uh, I don't know if you if you if you saw um, last time I mentioned that there was some issue with the new PIP 10 uh, version and Octoprint 13 
8 and 13 as shipped on Octopi 015 and that we were going to push out a fixed uh, image due to that and uh, that and um, yeah and this is what what a guy and me also did um, octoprint 139 will already ship with uh, a fix for this incompatibility to pip 10 so um, yeah once that is out there will also no be, not be a problem and i think it just started to rain outside <laughs> regardless um yeah, and as usual, I also did a lot of support and triaging existing issues and new issues and, and running after locks. And uh, once again, let me reiterate, if you report a bug in Octoprint or if you want to report an issue in Octoprint, you are welcome to do so. But please, 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 please include the locks and the information that you are asked for in the ticket template, because otherwise I, I, I really can't do anything. And it's uh, incredibly frustrating seeing that there is an issue and not having the information to fix it and most often they're not not even being able to get the user to provide it uh, because they just send off uh, the, the, the bug report and then they vanish. So yeah, please keep this in mind as always. <laughs> okay, so that's what I've been up to. Um, so what are the next steps? So as I mentioned, I really want to get out the first release candidate for 139. Most of the open points uh, there should now have been tackled. So all the bugs that I had already um, put into this milestone, uh, so hopefully all of them actually, <laughs> that, that are identified. Um, and, uh, and I only have uh, two or three items currently left on my to-do list that I still have to take a look at. Um, I also just today found a weird recent behavior in a, in a specific case, but I think that was more a case of a misconfiguration of the virtual printer on my part and less of the code. And actually I could repro reproduce the same behavior across all the past year or two years versions. So whatever it is, apparently it is not critical. I'll still take another look at that. And um, yeah, besides this, I also of course want now that I finally uh, um, started again, I also want to continue to work on the com layer on the new one. Um, yeah, I mean, now I've, I've wrapped my head back around all the new concepts and everything. And um, my, my development speed on this branch is now uh, somewhat back to normal. And uh, well, it's time to do to, to, to do, oh, sorry, <laughs> to do some tests with real hardware. Now, the thing is, um, I could have done this already, actually. The the code is there in order to run it against the real printer. The problem only is that I don't know if you are familiar with the weather in Germany, but we have a bit of a heat wave currently here. And um, this past week, I've been slowly melting in this office here because this there is a south facing window and over there is a south facing balcony door. And um, keeping this room cool enough to think was tricky enough, even without adding a heated bed and hot nozzles to it. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for some milder weather bec before I start uh, full blown uh, real hardware tests. But if push comes to shove, I'll have to soldier through, I guess, because yeah, next week I really want to shoot this stuff against some real printer hardware. All right, so, um, that would be the next steps. Um, and that brings us slowly but surely to our Q&A segment. And uh, this time I'm trying something uh, I'm trying something a bit differently uh, because, um, yeah, I I don't know how how you um, saw that. But but for me, it, it always felt a bit stupid reading to you the questions and, and, and you having to listen them and, and listen to them and trying to understand the question, which I was then going to answer. So this time I've prepared a small presentation with all the questions that were <laughs> asked beforehand. Of course, if someone now asks something in the in the live chat, I, I can't quickly put it in there, but at least the stuff that um, was prepared beforehand, we now have on hand. So let me quickly just switch over to that and I leave myself in the lower corner there. Nice, right? Awesome. Um, okay, so and the first question was by John. How's your new testing setup? You showed off your new soldering or iron on Twitter and you also mentioned soldering together a KVM type of setup for your SD cards and Raspberry Pis. Care to show it off? 
So um, I mentioned I wanted to solder together a new power station for my test pies and also brainstormed a bit regarding a KVM setup. Um, the problem is that, as usual, I simply haven't found the time to actually do that right, uh, as, of, as of yet. I, at least I have the parts bought uh, to, uh, for, for the uh, power supply. Uh, station thingy that I want to do, but I still have to design the enclosure and uh, actually put this together and somehow also fit it in this little corner where I have all my pies. Um, once I get around to do this, uh, uh, I'll be sure to share it on Twitter and also mention it here, of course, but uh, I still wanted to show you uh, um, a, a picture of what I currently have. So basically this uh, sits under my main monitor on the right side. Basically, this is the lower part of the monitor. Um, and you have uh, yeah, a bunch of pies there that I put on these little self-designed mounts that are have inter an interlocking design. And the plan is um, yeah, basically to incorporate this design into the power supplies and add into the power supply and then have individual switches underneath each pi to be able to toggle it instead of these extension thingies here with the with the button. Um, what you also see here is these extend micro SD card uh, micro SD card extensions uh, that I use to not having to fumble around with the micro SD on the back of the pi all the time every time that I need to flash octopi which I do a whole lot because um, yeah, basically on every release candidate and release prior to that, I uh, run through a whole checklist of um, update scenarios that I need to check if they run. So basically, usually I install something, Octopi, I flash Octopi something like five to seven or eight times, depending on the release type, um, put those images in a specific uh, start scenario last version, uh, last stable version, last maintenance release version, uh, the version it came with, the version it came with, but up manually update stuff like this. And then I test if the update to the new release works flawlessly. So these little micro SD slots see a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of action on, on release day. Um, and yeah, this setup here is, is really a great update um, from, from, the, from the former setup that I also had in this location where all these things were basically just lying there in a tangled heap. And I always had to try to figure out which cable went where and which SD card went where. And um, yeah, so this is really, really a huge update for me, <laughs> just getting these, um, these things set up. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I hope this answers this question for now. As I said, sadly, currently I have nothing more to show but this. Um, next question by Marion, non-technical question. Why Fusel? Okay, so that was one of those late night ideas. Uh, this nickname, uh, I was in a need for a new nick for various reasons that I'm not going to elaborate on here. And um, yeah, to know how this came together, I have to start a bit behind, um, a bit far back. So basically in programming, um, there are these commonly used variable names foo, F-O-O, and bar, B-A-R. Um, they are basically yeah, placeholders used when you are providing some kind of source code example or something to explain a concept. Uh, where more specific variable naming would not make much sense or is simply not needed and uh, might even confuse people more. So um, think of it basically as the John Doe or Jane Doe of variable names. Um, and that would be where the foo came from. Um, and for the rest, it's important to know that back when I came up with that nickname, I was heavily into re reading the user-friendly webcomic. I don't even know if this still exists, to be honest. Um, in that comic, there was a, a small creature called the Dust Puppy that, according to the webcomics lore, was born in a server room full of dust, lint and quantum events. And basically, um, yeah, it was a giant ball of lint with feet and big googly eyes. Um, and this, this part about the giant ball of lint is important here because lint in German is Fussel. And now you might already hear it. Hear it. So, I just put the two together, two, two together and that gave me Fusel. The problem now with Fusel is that um, 
in German, Fusel means cheap booze. Um, so this is the downside of this nickname. <laughs> but then again, I don't drink any alcohol. So I figured, well, people who know that will not confuse things and people who don't, well, if they get a laugh out it, a laugh, a laugh out it let them. Um, yeah, so that was the etymo etymology, etymology. I can't say this word apparently, but I hope you know what I mean. Uh, the origin, the origin story of my nickname. Okay, um, next question, also by Marion, another technical question, uh, non-technical question. How do you pronounce Heuske? There you have it, Heuske. Um, actually, this uh, is more or less a duplicate of a question that, uh, of a similar question that was asked back in Octoprint on air number four. And I would refer you to that to learn why this S there is actually an S and not a B and also a bit of the history behind it and why we have this thing in German and what it actually stands for. So because it's actually, it's, a, it's an S and a Z, but yeah, just in a weird conglomerated view. Anyhow, if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, be sure to check out Octoprint on air number four. Uh, it should be, uh, yeah, discoverable in the playlist. Uh, okay. And so let's move over to the next question, also by Marion. Marion was very busy. I really like that because now we at least have some questions. Last time it was a bit empty in the in the sheet. Um, you spend a lot of time on the G GDPR EU regulation. Why and how? Well, um, first of all, the why. I didn't have much choice on that matter. Uh, I don't know if you know about the GDPR. I mentioned it also in the last um, in the last uh, episode. Um, it's this new yeah, data privacy regulation in the EU that went into, uh, that went into, into action. No, how do I say it? My English is losing me right now, leaving, leaving me right now. Well, and it, it became active. Let's, let's put it that way. It became active on May 25th. And the thing there is that, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's made, it made, it makes it very strict. What kind of data, um, websites are allowed to, uh, log or to collect in a, in a more general sense and also to share with other stuff, with other services, for example, stuff, things like Google Analytics are a big problem. Uh, Google Fonts are a big problem. I had to swap all the Google Fonts on the website over to uh, local copies because of some legal issues with Google Fonts specifically. And yeah, it was just a really big mess. Not not actually made much more nice uh, by the fact that the that the EU at least in one um, how do you say in one ruling uh, determined that IP addresses are also personally identifiable information that are would be covered by this GDPR stuff. So um, yeah, server locks suddenly become a problem too. Um, yeah. And this does not concern private websites, but since, well, octoprint.org, pluginst.octoprint.org, and also the forum at discourse.octoprint.org certainly cannot fully be considered private websites, uh, at least not uh, considering that the, uh, that I make, uh, um, yeah, that I that I have uh, links to 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 my Patreon on there, and to my PayPal on there, and also to uh, some uh, some kids that support my work on Octoprint and I also have ads on there to support my work on Octoprint and you see the picture. So basically it is definitely not non-commercial and that makes it, um, uh, yeah, that makes it uh, covered or, or rather um, that makes the GDPR important for me. So I had to write a couple of privacy policies. I had to do, um, I had to, yeah, get in touch with a couple of services that I use, get them to send me or sign some, um, how, how is it called in, in English again, data, pro data processing agreements. Yeah, so it, it was a lot of fun, not? And um, in the end, uh, I did all this not because I actually feared getting sued by the EU for, for, for my stuff on octoprint.org, uh, but actually rather uh, by the litigation lawyer um, lawyers here in Germany. I don't know if litigation lawyer is the right, right word in, in English. Um, the thing is, it's, it, it, it might actually be a bit hard to translate. So basically, you have a bunch of lawyers going around in Germany trying to sue people uh, or, or hammer people with litigation and cease and desist notes that uh, are attached to huge fines and um, 
yeah, even if you find a way around paying those fines, you still have a lot of work with handling all that shit. And sorry for the word. And um, yeah, I really don't want to have to worry about stuff like that as well now. So um, yeah, so I spent a lot of time into making sure as sure as currently possible, because of course, not even the lawyers, uh, also any law lawyers in Germany or in the EU right now know exactly how to interpret it, this, this law and this, uh, this, uh, these regulations. And this will something that will be yeah, basically decided in court over the next decade or so. But for now, uh, well, I just tried to, to make everything um, match <laughs> what we currently know. And um, yeah, so writing a bunch of, as I said, writing a lot of, a ton of privacy policy stuff and, and, and figuring out what I even had to take a look at and, and all that. But well, in any case, um, I'm just happy that for now I'm through with all that and can uh, finally concentrate on, uh, yeah, the productive side of, of life again and actually get work done instead of uh, fighting legal. <clears throat> and, um, now it's just time to wait and see how things will develop, I guess. Yeah, um, that would be that. Um, and I'm getting a bit confused because I'm now seeing my cursor twice, once on the preview and <laughs> once on the actual screen. I, uh, I'm trying my best not to get too confused by that. Next question um, by Talia or Thalia. Um, my ANET A8 display shows weird messages and letter combinations as soon as it connects to Octoprint using Skynet 3D in the latest version. So first of all, I'm kind of missing the question there, but I'm making a guess here and uh, think that the question is, why is it doing that? So um, the problem is, it's pretty much sadly impossible to say with the amount of information that's available to me right now. Um, I would need logs, uh, most importantly, uh, the lock of the serial communication with the printer because that might contain some hint or, or a, either in with regards to what command Octoprint is sending and also how the printer is responding to them. Um, it might be something as simple as electrical noise that is causing the LCD to just yeah basically go mad. <laughs> I've seen this in the past with a couple of printers where I yeah uh, wired the display to too close to motor um, to motor wires and that caused them to uh, cause them to, sh to have weird characters on the display to show up and the LCD driver basically going well, uh, for the rest of the session until it was power cycled. But it's impossible to say really. So um, in general, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, co general compatibility issues between Octoprint and uh, ANET A8 printers. Um, <laughs> well, apart from Octoprint telling people Connecting uh, connecting it to an, uh, an ANET A8 with the stock firmware that this printer is inherently unsafe, um, but this isn't a, a compatibility issue; it's more a case of uh, education, <laughs> um, and it still works. Um, it just shows you a big warning message. Um, so, in, in general, I would suggest with questions like these to just get in touch on the on the um, yeah on the support forum at discourse.octoprint.org and be sure to share log files and also as much information about your setup as possible. So which version of Octoprint, which firmware version, version on the ANET A8, how it is connected, how both the, the, the machine running Octoprint, so probably a Pi and the printer are powered and all of that. Because every little detail really makes it easier to diagnose what might be the problem here. And hopefully, um, yeah, and hopefully uh, um, nail down the issue and uh, uh, eliminate it. Okay, so now let me take a look if there are any questions in the live chat. I don't think so, unless George wants to say anything more about the disconnect issue, but I'm not aware of that. So did you open a bug for uh, uh, regardless? Um, and um, yeah, George also just mentioned uh, I would have guessed wrong class SD card used for crazy screen issues. Mm, do you mean in the printer controller making the ANET A8 get wonky or because why then only when Octoprint connects because the SD card is then mount? I don't know. Yeah, more locks, more locks. <laughs> All right. Um, so as far as I can see, no 
no pressing issues at least not now, uh, right now in the in the live chat so let's just continue uh, with the questions here um, for those of us building larger printer farm uh, by Jeremiah sorry <laughs> for those of us building larger printer farms do you have any plans on a management dashboard that would allow the oversight of many printers all from one screen um, personally or rather I personally don't have plans because um, I have an octoprint does have an API um, uh, that makes all of this already perfectly possible and uh, I mentioned it in at least two <laughs> prior octoprint on airs episodes which I can't remember the number of right now but uh, there are existing solutions for this kind of stuff one printer uh, printer view I guess it was called is no longer ma maintained the other one is a command line interface um, uh, done by the guys from e3d so uh, by by Josh I think um, called Poseidon or something I also linked it uh, in one of the past uh, episodes. I'll try to make sure to include a link again into the description when I uh, put up the recording of this one for everyone to watch. But any in any case, as I mentioned, this printer view thing, which is basically a web page where you can register multiple instances, this um, is no longer maintained by the original author, uh, author that was German, sorry. However, the recently um, someone from the forum, and I can't remember the nick right now, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, anyhow, someone jumped in and uh, started developing it again and, and basically making it work <laughs> uh, with current versions and um, giving it some, some much needed love. And uh, I haven't yet been able to uh, test it properly, but at least this is something to hopefully look forward to. And I know that they are also working on a, on a desktop version, as far as I understand, um, that has the, base, uh, the same functionality. Um, and the first screenshots that uh, they shared on the on the forum look very promising. So maybe you just want to look at what is going on there. The thing is, um, uh, I I really I really do not want to say yeah sure I will do that because um, as I mentioned uh, several times and hinted at several times already, I'm already drowning in work. So I really can't shoulder that on top of everything else without anything. Uh, which should actually have a high priori priority uh, fall off the um, yeah fall off the wagon, and um, this is yeah I, simply not nothing that I can do. So as I said, we have an API um, which is well documented, and with this documentation plus even the JavaScript client that client library that is included in Octoprint, which is also documented fairly well, I think it should really be quite simple for anyone that really needs this and has a bit of um, coding practice under their belt to make this their first or even second or, or third project and, um, uh, and, and and just yeah implement it. So um, please do it. <laughs> Or, or please help whoever it was who is revamping uh, the printer view uh, project because um, yeah that would also be really nice. Okay, um, next question also by Jeremiah. Uh, what are your plans for queuing multiple jobs across multiple printers? Any plans on working with bot queue now or in the future? So um, first of all Justin uh, the, the maintainer of BotQ is actually one of my closest personal friends. And uh, so, heck yes. <laughs> but um, the thing is, we also yeah we also talked on and off about uh, a possibility of doing this. And uh, the thing is that right now he simply doesn't consider the timing to be right. Um, he wants to redo uh, parts of the API, um, change a lot of stuff. And if I were or he were now to develop an Octoprint plugin interacting with BotQ as it is right now, that all that stuff would then at a, a later date have to be scrapped again and rewritten. So right now is not the best time considering that it's already clear that things will change uh, so much that uh, stuff will be have to scrap. Um, uh, in any case, I really am following his lead here and uh, trusting him that he will tell me when the time is right. Yeah. And uh, so not a no, not a yes, no, no, no specific plans for right now. More, more like, yeah, we want to do that, but right now is not the best time. Okay. Um, 
And that already actually brings us to the last question that was prepared. And I think, yeah, we don't have, we don't have anything in the live chat right now. Um, from John, um, I've, uh, it was actually a lot longer than that. I've condensed it a bit due to the important bits. I hope that's okay. Um, Again, from the replicate side of things, we've been noticing some speed ups depending on what kind of caching we enable or disable in Tornado. Um, for single core servers, are there any optimizations that could be done to lighten the burden or speed up the load time, specifically the startup time? So, um, first of all, I'd be really interested in hearing uh, about those findings regarding tornado, regarding tornado caching, uh, because well, um, that doesn't ring a bell right now and would might be interesting. So if you could share that, I would be uh, really uh, happy. And um, with that being said, so all this caching that Octoprint is doing on startup, which is making the server startup somewhat slow, uh, especially of course on single core system or nah, the problem is not really the single core part, but more the part that the single core RPIs are also pies with very slow cores. So um, this is, um, yeah, and this is caused um, by, by intentional preemptive caching that Octoprint does. So basically the thing is, if you, Octoprint's whole web interface is one single HTML page. And this HTML page gets uh, coupled together from various parts, uh, parts that are built into Octoprint itself. So various templates, for example, the settings dialog, um, the temperature tab, all that stuff that always comes with Octoprint. And also anything that plugins provide to inject into the various places they can inject the components into. So the sidebar, the tab bar, the settings, the navigation bar at the top, and also um, uh, whatever additional dialogues they want to append basically to the page so they can, they can show them on demand. And um, also wizards, of course, I forgot the wizards. Um, and all that stuff takes a while to, uh, especially on, on slower machines, to, to render together. Uh, first of all, to collect from all the plugins and then to actually render it out uh, into, into proper HTML from the template, turning it basically from this huge document of various templates into one single HTML um, page that can be rendered in a browser. And uh, what Octoprint does is it will do this when you access it over its base URL. So if you go to, for example, if you go to Octopi local, um, it will render this index page and then deliver it to the browser if it is not yet cached because Octoprint will very, very aggressively cache this page because it's so expensive to create, especially on the slow embedded systems that it's usually running on. And um, so, so usually once you've, once this page has been built once, it will not be it will not be built again unless one of the templates of the underlying templates changes, um, which usually won't happen during usual um, production uh, um, runtime. Of course, it, it's it's a different case during development, but when you have it running and uh, not are not actively working on it, it usually will not uh, have to be re-rendered. Uh, because it's cached. And in order for you, when you first access Octoprint, uh, not having to wait for two or three minutes, in, in the worst case, for this page to be created um, and cached so that it can from then on be delivered in seconds, um, Octoprint since version of, I don't know since when, where, what version, one, two, something, um, has uh, a preemptive cache built in. So what it will do on, so it, every time you access this page, it will remember in what way you accessed it. So the important bits here are the, the IP through which you, uh, or rather the host name through and port through which you accessed Octoprint, uh, because some URLs are um, also embedded in this, in this web page. So that would then have, have to change then and also the language. Uh, the browser language that was requested. So if you access, access it from a German browser in, in German language, it will be a different HTML than if you access it from uh, an English language uh, browser. So um, 
Octoprint will keep track of that and remember how often you use what combination basically. And uh, then on startup, it will go through this list of combinations that it saw, um, beginning with the most uh, most used and 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 uh, um, also last used one, and then basically simulate you accessing Octoprint via the browser with this browser configuration and uh, therefore populating the cache. And this is what takes long. You can al also access Octoprint while this is happening and um, you will probably then also still have to wait because uh, then it will basically have to do the work uh, twice uh, because you are hitting it at the point where the cache is not yet populated. So it will think it has to redo it. And this also makes things extremely slow. But um, in general, um, since Octoprint usually should be considered a server that you start up and then use for weeks or, or months, uh, keep running and, until you update it, basically. Uh, at least that was my intent behind writing it and not, you know, having it like an appliance, switching it only on like seconds before you want to print. Um, uh, yeah, since this is the case, usually you only have a slow startup somewhere in the distant past. And uh, once that's through, everything should be fast. Uh, and this is the idea behind that uh, whole preemptive cache and general aggressive caching of this page. But um, if this is causing any kind of problems, uh, or yeah, making development tricky or something like that, it can be disabled. Uh, there is a setting in, I think it was devil.cache.preemptive and you can just set that to false uh, in, in config YAML. And if you do that, then, well, it will no, no longer populate the preemptive cache. I think it will still record. <laughs> um, so it will st will still track how often you access this page in what way and still create basically the yeah the the the, the stuff that the preemptive caching system uses in order to populate the cache but uh, it will no longer do this on startup and um, you also can disable the caching completely but that certainly will not speed anything up uh, in in uh, in fact it will make things definitely worse so I would not advise doing that yeah. Um, And I think that was what I wanted to say. So let me, since this was the last question that was prepared, let me quickly switch back to me in full screen. Hooray. And um, yeah, so I, I think I just saw some saw something pop up in the live chat. So let me quickly take a look. Is there a way to be able to change home all G code on web page UI from G28 to G29 for those that run auto level, like maybe a proverbial switch to select G28 or G29? So currently right now that isn't uh, possible. I mean, what you could do is uh, you could um, have a plugin replace any and all G28 that goes over the line with the G29, but I'm not sure that you want to do that. Um, if you want, though, that would be possible. You could also write a plugin that just uh, changes the, the G code that is triggered there, I think. Uh, I'm not entirely sure right now because it might be that that is actually calling. Uh, no, that's not 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 easily possible. Um, uh, but um, yeah, this is actually something that I just uh, implemented in and, and, and deepened in implementation in the new com layer um, it's uh, that you now have all this stuff all this this what kind of command is sent for jogging for homing for i don't know requesting the list of sd card files from the printer or uh, resetting the line number or whatever so all this stuff is now defined in a flavor in a so-called flavor and flavors can easily be uh, added um, through plugins and uh, will also be auto detected by Octoprint based on uh, patterns, on matching patterns and all that. So what you could do really is uh, in the future, <laughs> once uh, one for all hits, which again, I don't have a date for yet, um, not even close. And now we are also getting apparently a thunderstorm, sorry for that. Um, so what you will be able to do in these cases then is uh, just uh, add a new flavor that replaces G28 with G29 and that will then do that. 
So when you're in that case, then click home, it will send a G29 instead of G28. Um, but right now, as I said, you would probably have to do something like either replace all of them. You could, you could also maybe write a plugin that monkey patches the printer class to use G29 on the home command instead instead of G28 if all X's are um, if no X's are specified. So basically, if if you just send a G28 and not a G28 X Y or whatever, then it would um, replace it with the G29. Or what you could also do is um, just um, provide a, a customized printer implementation. As I just remembered, you can also do that via a plugin. I <laughs> keep forgetting stuff like that. But yeah, you could then overwrite the home method and uh, do it that way. And that would replace this um, stuff as well. So, and I think, so I don't have any questions from the backlog left. I think we don't have anything in the live chat either. In that case, I guess we'll just continue on with the wrap up, which is good because uh, the temperature in here is rising. Um, so uh, as usual, I'll um, get uh, uh, the, the next Octoprint on Air broadcast will be roughly in a month. I can't promise the next exact, exact date yet. I have to consult with my uh, calendar and also with my SO. Um, but uh, as usual, I will uh, post the appointment on Patreon and also create this this event thing that you can then subscribe to and all that. So the usual stuff. And um, until then, <laughs> all that's left to say for now is just, yeah, thanks for being here, for watching. And I hope it was interesting. Um, I, I certainly try to not make it too technical, <laughs> uh, but, but also not too non-technical. I hope this was a good mixture this time. And uh, yeah, until next time then, I guess um, have fun, happy printing and goodbye.